child of a struggling family. I left school at 14, owned my own business by the time I was 16. I'm now a tycoon with my own airline and a Formula One racing team. Well, don't feel too bad if you've never heard the name. Paul Stoddart is a quiet achiever with very big plans. So come along as this deal-making, speed-loving Aussie lets us in to his extraordinary life. Just straight from the team owners meeting. It's a rare treat. Um, no rest for the wicked, mate, I'm afraid. You never stop. This is Formula One. An invitation to join the private jet and larrikin lifestyle of Australia's newest Formula One team owner. Right you lot. Those of you that are going to sit down, please fasten your seat belts. Those of you that are smoking, please put them out and don't burn the goddamn seats. His name is Paul Stoddart and he owns the Minardi team. We are uh, about to depart to somewhere in Italy. I haven't got... An clue where we're going because three of the airports we're heading for are bogged out but we will get there somehow also on board another australian team driver mark webber dreaming perhaps of formula one glory if only an a10 you see an a10 anyway the boss could just find his way you remember the names of the towns or anything mm -hmm. stuff that i can either somewhere, somewhere in here well, there's a track right yeah. This is where we're going to be tomorrow. Now, we were supposed to land here. May so I say, I'm still very concerned that you are reading an Italian street directory at 30,000 feet. So am I, <laughs> basically. The, well, plane, we the plane knows where it's going, but when we get on the ground where we're going, nobody knows. I'll leave so you with it. I hope your Italian's pretty good, because <laughs> mine isn't, even after a year. The next day and we finally made it to Milan's fog-bound Verano testing track. It's costing Stoddard $100,000 a day just to rent this circuit. This is the side of Formula One that people don't really see. Basically, we send 30, 40 people here We're doing an aerodynamics test. Got two race cars here. But yeah, I mean, this isn't the glamour and the glitz of Formula One. This is the real hard sort of grind that every team goes through during the off-season. Test, test, test. You can't get enough testing. And even on lousy cold days like this, mechanics are up, caught to five in the morning, get the cars on heat, come out to the track. We might only get a few hours running if we're really lucky today because of the fog. Do it all again tomorrow, the next day, until we get ready to go to Melbourne. This is Stoddart's lifelong dream to mix it with the big boys in the hugely competitive world of Formula One. It's a high-octane, high-tech, high-cost addiction. I love Formula One. It's the world's greatest sport. There's no doubt about that. It's watched by six billion people. 350 million a race. There's no more worldwide media that people can get their message across to. I think my investment in Formula One it's a solid investment. So you promise me you're not dreaming, you're, you are being realistic. Yeah, there's no dreams with this boy. If nothing else, Paul Stoddart loves a risk, always has. Who else would spend his spare time strapped to the wing of a biplane? But planes aren't just a hobby, they're his business. Well, We're this is your latest you. acquisition. Yep, it's uh, one serious beast. Something I've sort of think ever since I've been in aviation, I had two dreams. One was to run 747s and the other's to run Concorde. Well, one out of two and we don't give up on the other one yet. You serious? Yeah, one day. It's impressive and lucrative, and it's called European Aviation. From its base here in Bournemouth, just outside London, Stoddart's airline turns over a quarter of a billion dollars a year. We've got 11 BAC 111s, we've got uh, 13 Boeing 737s and we've now most recently got, of course, the uh, six Boeing 747s and a couple of Airbus A300s thrown in for good measure. That adds up to 32. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you did the additions. I left school when I was 14, it wasn't my strong point. You left school when you were 14 yeah. years old? Yeah. Well, I figured they taught me how to read, write, and I wish I'd learned a language because later life I sort of regretted not doing that. Um, but I figured, hell, let's get out there and get into the business world. If it flies or drives, Paul Stoddart will definitely try it. And then, 
probably buy. He now has one of the largest collections of Formula One racing cars in the world. His life is truly a remarkable story. His parents didn't even own a car. They were battlers from Coburg in Melbourne. By 14, their only son was an apprentice mechanic. By 16, he had his own business. And by age 28, he bought his first plane. All right, we've got one more spare. Then in 1989, while in England, came the deal that truly set him up. I got woken up at three or four in the morning by somebody who didn't know the time difference and said, hey, mate, you interested in buying five jets from the RAF? I actually got up, got dressed, booked myself on the Qantas flight at lunchtime that day and at midday I was flying to Australia and the rest, as they say, is history. It was the deal of a lifetime. Stoddart bought the jets and their spare parts for a song and then sold them in the UK for a fortune. European aviation was born and Stoddart's millions started to pile up. Enough to do yet another deal and buy his way into Formula One last year. 9th of January, I got a phone call to say, OK, if you want it, you can have it at your price, which was a lot less than they were asking. And the difference is you've got to be in Melbourne in six weeks and three days. And by the way, there's no engine, there's no car, there's nothing. Just to get the team to Melbourne on the starting grid of the 2001 Australian Grand Prix was a Herculean effort the like of which I've never seen before. Until he retired last year, Murray Walker was the voice of Formula One. A commentator for more than 50 years, he knows a winner when he sees one. They look frighteningly quick, they are quicker. On the he's, he's like me and like many of us, he's a Formula One nutter. To succeed in Formula One, you've got to be a fast-moving, high-stepping, tough, ruthless, entrepreneurial type. I'll give you a few names, Bernie Ecclestone. Ron Dennis, Eddie Jordan, Frank Williams, Paul Stoddart. Paul Stoddart is one of those. He's got what it takes. If you want it in one word, driven. I have actually probably achieved everything I want to achieve in life. It's come at a bit of a price. Um, I've had some lovely girlfriends and wives through the years, um, and they're all, you know, my best friends. I mean, they're, they're all like family to me. Um, but, you know, after five or six years, most of them have given up on me um, because it's a hard life for anybody that's around me. But if you work your life away, then you get to a point where you really find it quite hard to, to actually wind down and enjoy yourself. And, and really, that's probably where I'm at. But I get my enjoyment out of success. For a man driven to succeed, Paul Stoddard bought into failure. In almost two decades, Minardi has never had a podium finish. Last year, his first year as an owner was no exception. Of the 12 Formula One teams, well, let's just say they didn't make the top ten. And Michael Schumacher wins the Australian Grand Prix. But Stoddart has a plan. His name is Mark Webber, an Australian with a reputation for being very, very quick. Mark, if it was a fog-free day, what sort of speeds would you be doing down the straight? Uh, well over 300, yeah, well over 300. But we're shrouded in fog, so what will that bring you back to? Uh, probably 298. <laughs> <laughs> a proven winner in Formula 3000 racing, this season is the 25-year-old Webber's debut in Formula 1. Do you always have faith you'd see that name on the side of an F1 car? <laughs> uh, yeah, I did. Yeah, I knew we were going to get there. Yeah, I knew we were going to get there, but uh, it's not an easy road, you know. And uh, well, I never expected it to to, to be uh, to be slapped on there overnight. You know, it's something you got to work towards. So uh, it's it's happened, and uh, can't wait, mate. Just can't wait. Potentially, what's Mark Webber got for you? Realistically, is he good enough? Oh, he's good. Mark's got what it takes. Mark can climb and will climb to the podiums in, in Formula One. I just hope he does it with me. There's an unmistakable exuberance about this team, even a touch of the larrikin. But these Australians are very serious. And they can't afford not to be. It costs Stoddart $100 million a year just to get to the grid. For 
front running teams like Toyota and Ferrari, that's loose change. At the end of the day, this is business. We talk about Toyota's two-year budget. It's, it's a reported figure. I can't say with any certainty that it's true, but it's been well reported that they spent 625 million US dollars for their two-year plan. Now, if that's true, that's 1.3 billion Australian dollars to run a Formula One team for two years. And here's little old me spending 100 million a year. Well, if I beat them, who's got it right? How much money do you need to spend to get to that midfield, to get to that podium? I need another 50 mil. You can just translate money to actual performance. Basically, one-tenth of a second, one million US dollars. We will lift Minardi up, we will get there. Um, as the famous words go, watch this space. Paul's the guy, that, as long as I've known him, he's, he will get the job done, whatever it is. Look what he's done with his airline and, and now he's going to do with Minardi. Bernie Eccleston is the most powerful man in motorsport. He created the Formula One we see today. So give me the spin, Bernie. What's it like having Paul Stoddard, Mark Webber, Minardi on the grid for Melbourne? Super. Good, good, good. And even more important, it's good that we have the first race in their country. So the Australian team's in Australia. I mean, he's done a big, 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 big thing for Australia. We've now got basically an Australian team in Formula One with as much Australians as we can get involved. And uh, it's like getting back with Jack Brabham. Once a year, the Formula One circus comes to town. But it's been a long time since Australia has tasted any success. Alan Jones was our last world champion way back in the early 80s. Stoddart is realistic enough to know he won't win this year, but he can see the rewards. He's already seen what F1 has done for other newcomers like the Jaguar team. The Jaguar hasn't had any racing success yet. But my God, have you seen their sales since they came into Formula One? They've just gone like this. It is the place to be. But do you need to be vicious to survive in this sport? You need to keep your business head on at all times. I mean, this is a sport that takes no prisoners. This is, a, this is, this is serious stuff. This is serious money. This is serious people. And there is no forgiving. There is no room for mistakes. Not many people can say they've lived their dream. Paul Stoddart can. And with the finish line in sight, whatever the result, next weekend will be a homecoming to remember for this kid from Coburn. I'll be very emotional, touching down in my hometown on my own 747, my own Formula One team on board, my own two-seaters and Formula One cars in the hold, coming to the Australian Grand Prix with an Australian driver. I mean, I don't really know how much better it can get. Yeah, I think we could get a podium. Well, that's not realistic. But, by God, I could, you know, dream on. I'd love to do that. That, that would be the end. If we even get a point, that would be, that would just be you couldn't contain me. You could not contain me.